me personally, I, I'm a modeler, a radiation modeler. So uh, we, we have that in common, which is probably how, how we come to be talking to each other. And most of my stuff is things like modeling chromosome aberrations, but also modeling uh, carcinogenesis uh, and analyzing uh, epidemiological data, uh, A-bomb survivor data, for example, that sort of thing. Um, so probably enough about you, about me. Um, uh, this is about you. Uh, you could either give you a, give a, a little pen picture about you, or, or we could just kick off with the questions that we discussed before. Um, perhaps you could give a, a little uh, three-minute pen picture of yourself, uh, your background, how you how you come to be uh, uh, where, uh, where you are. Yes. Yeah, so uh, I'm an associate professor here at Yes. Um, in the Division of Biophysics and Bioinformatics of the Department of Oncology of the School of Medicine here at Hopkins, uh, also in the Biostat Department of the School of Public Health. Uh, my background is in mathematics. Uh, my PhD is in applied math. Uh, and then um, during my PhD, I, uh, I wanted to... At uh, some point, I decided I wanted an application, and because I started actually pure mathematics, and then uh, at that point, um, um, cancer modeling and you know uh, looked to me uh, very very interesting and uh, very meaningful, I would say, and so that's how I got into this field, and then uh, then I went to Boston for a postdoc uh, with Giovanni Parmigiani. And uh, which was in biostatistics uh, because I wanted to get my hands dirty with, with data, and from there uh, I came here at Hopkins. So, and pretty much what I do is, you know, I'm interested in uh, cancer etiology and I, I model evolution, and uh, and also um, now I'm also working in uh, early detection, cancer early detection. So that's a little bit for me. Okay. Um... So what, what, what got you interested specifically in, in, in cancer uh, modeling? Is, is it, uh, and w was it uh, good mathematics or, or the societal implications or both? Yes. Um, well, uh, you know, from, from a scientific point of view, from, from a human perspective, of, of all the applications, you know, a typical one for applied math was finance. I, I thought it was... Uh, more meaningful to me, um, I think, as that one, you know, I had uh, relatives that were affected by cancer, so it sounded very meaningful. And from a scientific point of view, um, um, I come from uh, probability and uh, stochastic processes, and so um, uh, the you know cancer evolution with these cells that divide, and every time they divide, uh, mutations may occur, and so on was very much along the lines of the things that I, I liked. And so it was a, a natural, um, say, transition. OK. Well, so tell, tell me about what, what you're doing at, at the moment and, and what's exciting you at the moment. Yes. So um, I would say um, the two main things are uh, cancer etiology and uh, early detection. So for cancer etiology, um, uh, what, is, what is very interesting to me is that um, thanks to uh, the data that we have available today, uh, uh, you know, we, we can answer, I think, better to questions like what causes cancer. And uh, I, um, you know, I, I recently published a series of papers that seem to indicate that there is an important component of uh, the mutational load that takes a person to cancer, uh, which is just normal, it just uh, belongs to what I would say I would call background. Or, you know, uh, and, uh, and that was, was somewhat surprising. Um, in general, uh, cancer etiology has been described as, um, you know, uh, due to inherited factors and uh, environmental factors. Uh, but it turns out that uh, this uh, uh, 
background, uh, or something we also call it bad luck component, um, uh, seems to be fairly large uh, based on our estimations. And, uh, and even to me, it's very, very exciting to try to uh, under better understand this process and what are the factors that uh, contribute to it in a more precise quantitative way. Uh, on the other side, early detection, uh, because um, well, let, let's uh, let's uh, let's let's stick with etiology for a bit, and then then we'll move to uh, early detection. So this 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 third way, uh, uh, this third uh, mechanism for causing cancer, do you think it's fundamentally different from the two uh, basic mechanisms that we all think about, um, genes and environment, or is is it a part part of those, or it's a third, a third mechanism. Yeah, um, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, first of all, you know, it, it's uh, as in mathematics, it's a lot about definitions. So, if we define environment as everything that's not um, inherited, then automatically, also this third component belongs to the environmental side. Um, but uh, I, I believe that, um, um, so I, I like better to think in terms of uh, uh, what is avoidable and what is not. And while this may change in time, of course, I believe that there are certain things that are just uh, you know, uh, required by the simple fact that we are uh, living beings. So uh, for example, oxidation, just something that happens. And uh, we may be able to reduce it uh, in the future. I don't know, but uh, as as of now, um, you know, a person that essentially is not exposing self or herself to smoking and all, all the very well known uh, risk factors will still have um, uh, this uh, no component that cause mutations in our bodies. So that's what I define as as this third factor. Um, essentially what is unavoidable as of today to a person that's you know being normal trying to to do it his best to uh, to avoid the bad stuff so it, um so it's and, and to finish answering your question it's so the mechanism is actually i think it's uh, uh, if you want the same uh it's just that uh, in the literature i feel up to this type of studies i want to focus on what you know, non-environmental factors uh, do um, to increase the background in, in a sense almost disregarding uh, uh, its relevance. And um, my research just wanted to focus on how important is this background. So, so uh, your, your papers became very controversial. Why, why, why do you think that was? I mean, you got people annoyed from a variety of uh, different uh, areas. So why, 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 why did, how come that, that happened, do you think? Um, I think? I think that the main uh, issue was, um, uh, especially with epidemiologists, uh, but I, I think the main issue was that um, Again, uh, in every single description I have seen of uh, what causes cancer uh, on websites, on you know main journals and so on, uh, there was always this uh, uh, either inherited or environmental components that were taking uh, the, the full, uh, you know, the, the full, the full of the explanation. And uh, so I think. Uh, by saying that there is a large component that is just normal, since um, uh, the whole thing started with, you know, the fact that we know that about 40 or so, uh, um, 40 to 50 percent of cancers are preventable, cancer cases, um, and I think in the field the thought was because probably the inherited component is something like around 10 percent, at least these are the estimates. The field felt that there was still like a, about a 40 to 50 percent that needed to be discovered uh, in the environment. So telling them that maybe not all of that, of course, but the important proportion of that may just be actually normal and unavoidable. That, um, um, yeah, probably that was uh, very different from what they expected and, and, and some didn't like it. 
and that this 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 different balance between uh, avoidable and non-avoidable. Do you think that will be very different for different types of cancers? Oh, it is. I mean, and, and we know from epidemiological studies that um, you know, for some cancer, uh, the proportion, for example, lung cancer, uh, at least today, uh, you know, if you look at the numbers, current numbers, it's about ninety percent preventable for for what we know today. While there are other cancer types, um, and I'm thinking especially, um, you know, childhood cancers, for example. Um, the, where the preventable proportion seems uh, very, very small. So, yeah, it is a function of which, and also, importantly, it's a function of time uh, because um, uh, the better we get at um, reducing the effects of uh, environmental factors, uh, the more these numbers will shift. So. Mm. Well, that gives us a good uh, link into early detection if we're talking about lung cancer. So uh, t tell me what, what, what you've been doing in the early detection uh, world. Yes, um, for early detection, what we have been uh, working on uh, is um, essentially a blood test that, um, uh, using information from uh, circulating tumor DNA and and levels of proteins and measurements of proteins in the blood um, seem to uh, be able to uh, detect uh, cancer even at early stages. And for now, this, uh, this test um, uh, has been developed for the eight major cancer types. And um, uh, on one side, there is the experimental side of collecting all of this information. It, it's a blood test, so there are measurements, there is sequencing, and then there is um, essentially there are mathematical algorithms that have to decide if whatever signal was found in that patient, if, if that is real and it's, it's cancer or not. And then uh, once that is uh, decided, it's been classified, uh, the next question that uh, we have been able to answer somewhat successfully is from which tissue is that coming? Uh, which it's a big challenge, of course, because we are only looking at signal found in, in blood. So are, are you hoping for a, a prediction of all, all cancers or some specific cancers, this, this test, your, your blood test? Well, I, th I think in the future, definitely, uh, you know, this, this blood test uh, will check for all cancers. Um, but uh, yeah, for now, we are focused on, on this main aid. Because you, you I, I'm, as I'm sure you know, there, there are enormous debates going on about uh, screening and early detection in the field of prostate cancer and the field of lung cancer. Some people say that the uh, that the the successful screening programs are uh, illusory and uh, are not real. Uh, where, where do you stand there? Yeah, I, I think it's a very important question, and and really uh, we'll have the definitive answer only. If you know, by, by applying them and, and see what happens. But um, I, I think, you know, I guess two things. Uh, at a personal level, if you ask me, would you like to know um, that you have, you know, a malign tumor in your body right now? Uh, uh, the answer would be yes. And, and I think, I understand some people may not want to know that, but, and I respect that, but I think in general, we should always want to know that uh, from a scientific point of view. Then the question is that we may not be able as of today to manage that information in the best way. But that's a kind of like a separate problem. I feel like, you know, I'm working on just trying to find as early as possible. Then there is the different question, which requires also a lot of research, which is underfunded, of course, which is once you have that information, what is the right approach? And you were mentioning prostate, which is probably, you know, one of the worst um, cases for thinking in terms of early detection. On the other side, I've seen recent uh, research, um, uh, maybe a month or two ago, uh, from a from a large uh, European meeting where it was showing that, um, you know, by not using PSA, it seems uh, because uh, in some cases, you know, even PSA has been controversial. Um, uh, it seems like 
uh, the results were uh, worse for people. So again, I my guess would be that in the long run, we will want to know um, then the question is how to manage that information. To the yeah, I, I guess my feeling is a, a lot with with early detection and screening, a, a lot of people are going to be treated that really don't need treating. But then again, there are certainly some people that are going to be treated that will save their lives. So that's a, that's a balance which is very difficult to, uh, to achieve, I think. Right. Let's see. Okay, well, uh, you're going to be talking at a radiation meeting. So um, have, have you worked with radiation um, um, at all? Or do you see radiation carcinogenesis as part of the, the sum total of carcinogenesis or, or different in some way? Yeah, I just, I just started. And in this meeting, it's going to be a good opportunity to, you know, to, to start doing something in that direction. Um, I, I guess, uh, you know, the way I see radiation, and, and I'm not uh, an expert, uh, so, uh, but um, I guess I, I, there is one difference uh, from other uh, type of environmental uh, exposures, which seems to me like the, the fact that it's a very, uh, you know, it's a, a discrete uh, event, at least, I guess, depending on which type of radiation we are talking about. But, you know, if we're talking about the atomic bomb, it's, it's a, it's a one-time event that, you know, lasts for a long time, but it's different from, say, the smoker that's constantly uh, inflaming his or her lungs uh, in time. So, so that modeling makes, you know, that, of course, as you are aware, uh, from a modeling point of view, it's a, uh, uh, yeah, it's a different model. And what, one of the nice things about radiation, my, my view, is, is the dosimetry in general is better than for other types of uh, carcinogens. Uh, pe people work much harder on, on getting the exact dose from in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, trying to figure out the dose of tobacco that you got over your lifetime is very, very hard. Okay. Uh, let's see. Ah, right. Bert Vogelstein, one of my heroes, I will say. Uh, so you worked closely with with uh, Dr. Vogelstein for a good while. So how how how, is, how has that been? How has how has he influenced your your thinking? Yes, uh, we we spend you know a good amount of hours every week together, and it, it has been a, a fantastic experience. I mean, he's an incredible mentor. Um, I I love how it focuses, and you know, it's always about big problems. So. There is it's just fantastic. Um, uh, I think uh, to me, uh, one also very important uh, thing that came from uh, collaborating with him is that um, when I see him without an answer, then that's very interesting to me. <laughs> uh, that's a good comment. Uh, that's in fact how how this uh, all this bad luck uh, came about. Because uh, anyway, so you know when. Uh, because he's so knowledgeable, um, then uh, that's a good sign usually. If he doesn't have an answer, then that, that is an important question. So I would say that's uh, kind of... Good. Okay. And finally, we're, 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 the, the whole field of, uh, of, of carcinogenesis modeling, where, where do you see it going in the next whatever decade? Um, and like similar question, where, what do you want to be working on in 10 years' time? Uh, yes. Um, well, I think that we are moving toward, you know, um, we are moving to precision medicine, so, you know, more personalized uh, type of approaches, and uh, which I think is great. Uh, I think that's uh, one main direction that I see. Uh, on my side, um, uh, beside the early detection, uh, I, I really like to... Uh, do risk prediction. I think that uh, you know once once we'll have this um, way to detect cancer early, another important task would be to stratify the population based on the risk. And as of today, risk prediction in cancer it's almost non-existent. I would I would say. So that's something that's very interesting to me. 
I, I, I think that's that's a little strong. I, I was thinking of the breast cancer world where they, they, they do have models, predict predictive models for uh, for who's going to be sent uh, at risk for breast cancer. You, you could argue they're not great, but they, they do exist, right? Yeah, no, you're right. There are there are exceptions, yes. But you know, I, I was thinking overall across all cancer types uh, as, as of today, there is not really a lot, and 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 much of what we have is um, uh, relative to the inheritance component. Yeah, uh, that's so, that's fair comment. So you, right. So if you have BRCA mutation, then of course and so on. But but the thing is that because the inheritance component seems to explain only, you know, a part of that. Um, I think that we should be able to to build models that are inclusive of more factors. And uh, so, so, how does it how does this fit in with quote bad luck? I mean, bad, uh, luck is inherently um, un unpredictable. Yeah. Um, well, uh, th there is um, um, th that's a great question. Um, so. You know, first of all, even just the combination, even before getting to the luck, even just the combination of inherited factors and environmental factors in a, in a, in a better way, I think it's a big, uh, you know, research direction for, for the future. Getting Now that we are getting all this information that before we didn't have. Um, uh, the bad luck, it is stochastic, but, you know, uh, the environment is stochastic too. I, I can smoke and, uh, and never get cancer, right? So, um so uh, stochasticity is everywhere. Uh, it, uh, in fact, the, this background, it's, it's just one process as every other process. So I think it can be modeled, uh, you know, one obvious component is age. That's obvious. Right. And in, I would say that's the main ingredient, in fact, of what I would call bad luck. And we know how important is age in prediction. But uh, I think we can be more precise than that. I'm sure we can. I'm sure we can. Okay. Well, uh, I, th I think I should uh, perhaps wrap this up and say thank you. Uh, we're very much looking forward to your talk in Chicago. I personally, I hope we will uh, we will get together in Chicago and uh, and chat more about these things.